Hey everyone, I'm Siddharth, a volunteer with the iSpirit Foundation. Uh, I primarily focus on how do we give Indians control over their data, be it financial, health, uh, telecom, etc., so that they can get empowered to access better services. Uh, besides that, I also work on Digital Sky, where we're building out a framework uh, for Indian airspace to support millions of drones and a couple of other projects. Uh, iSpirit is primarily a non-profit think tank for, for those of you that are not too familiar about us. Uh, we take a long-term view of problems, typically a 30-year view. And the two problems we picked up are financial and health inclusion. And then taking that 30-year view, we work backwards saying, what are those fundamental building blocks uh, that India needs at an infrastructure level to achieve that? Um, especially on the financial inclusion side, um, India is completely credit starved, and I've, I've seen quite a few folks from lending companies out here. Right? You've got 8.8 .8 million business, 12 million businesses registered on GST. About eight and a half million of them pay tax every month, but only about 1.2 to 1.5 million of them have ever got access to formal credit. Right? If we can technically give the, the remaining 6.5 or 6.2 million businesses access to formal credit, if they even have, get the chance to hire one more person, you're creating six million jobs. Right? And the numbers are equally stark on the retail side. You've got 30 million thick files in bureaus, about 150, 200 million thin files. Right? So there are a billion Indians that don't have a presence in a single credit bureau on the retail side. Right? And 30 million is relatively a rounding error, given the size of our population. And so over the past 10 years, what we at iSpirit have been focused on is solving for a person called Rajni. So think of Rajni as uh, uh, she's a food seller uh, by the roadside. Uh, she takes a loan in the morning and retires it in the evening. Typically, she pays interest rates today in the informal system anywhere between 1% to 2%, which works out to annualized about 300 to uh, 600, 700%, right? which is exorbitantly high. Right? Uh, if she has a chance to access this credit in the formal system, even if lenders charge probably 80%, which is still high, uh, it's far better than the prevalent rates. Right? So the question is, how do we make it uh, economically viable for businesses to start serving people like Rajni? Right? And so about 10 years back, we started off doing that. If you look at the needs of Rajni, she needs to get a loan, and hence she can access that through a credit marketplace app. She needs to share data about herself. Uh, uh, data about her positive cash flows, right? the goods and services she sold, as well as data about her previous borrowings so that lenders can make an informed decision. She needs the ability to, once data has been shared, see multiple loan offers and should have choice to pick the best one depending on interest, repayment, and other related rates. Right? And once she accepts the best offer, she must have the ability to legally sign that document and probably store it somewhere right? and uh, receive the loan and make her repayments again in a digital low cost manner. Uh, in order to do that, what we've been working on in a very focused manner is building out the corresponding building blocks. So the first one started off with Aadhaar, where it became a low cost manner for her to prove her identity. And that led to the introduction of eKYC and eSign. eKYC essentially became a way for her to electronically share her KYC data uh, at a very low cost manner versus currently a person would pay, a bank would pay probably 1500 to send a human being uh, to her doorstep to collect documents, process it, data entry operators. Today you could do that at a cost level of a few unit rupees. Right? Once she does an eKYC, she needs an ability to share the different data sets that she has about herself. And that's the focus of today's session. Essentially, how the consent layer of what's called the India stack uh, uh, is designed, and how is it rolling out as we speak. Um, and once she shares her data through AP, open APIs like eSign, uh, which last year we did about 30 million, and this year India is on track uh, to do probably be one of the largest consumers of eSign when GST and others go live, uh, uh, can electronically sign her document in a non-reputable, trusted manner. Right? And that's legally valid in the IT Act, and then store it in her digi locker. And, uh, and post that through UPI, uh, make and receive uh, uh, payments, and subsequently handle repayments of a loan. Uh, one topic, especially for the lenders in the room, which I'm not going to cover today, is the concept of e-lien. 
So especially as you move towards cash flow based lending, uh, there are really two fundamental requirements. Uh, insights into her data flows, which we talk about through the consent framework. And second, the ability to place programmatic control on your cash flows so that you can improve your collections rate. Right? So let's say, for example, a restaurant takes a loan. The first step is, can I disperse that? And he takes a loan for utilities. Instead of dispersing it to his uh, uh, account directly, could I disperse it straight to the utility bill company through something like BBPS? And second, whenever the restaurant receives money, which is consumers paying through the form of a QR code on a restaurant bill, can I get a programmatic right place so that 10% or 20% of every payments now comes to meet the lender? So on the 29th, and we'll send a follow-up, uh, a workshop will be done on e-liens and, and how that's going to roll out. Um, and what we noticed, I mean, uh, last month, a UPI crossed about 880 million transactions. What India does in a single day on UPI uh, is, is great, as Sharad says, greater than Amex's transactions worldwide. And it's still very early days. I mean, the goal is how do we get to a billion transactions a day? And as subsequent layers of India stack rolled out and connectivity permeated, uh, what we noticed were Indians were becoming data rich at an exponential pace. Now, the paradigm was slightly different. In the West, rather more developed economies, when the users became data rich, because they were already economically well off, data was fundamentally used to shape their spending patterns. Right? So I would create an application, gather user data, and show personalized ads to the user. And then I'd earn a commission on whatever product or service they bought. Right? And that's a hugely powerful business model reflected in the fact that some of your largest companies, both by market cap and revenue, uh, are fundamentally ad-driven companies. Now what's interesting, what we noticed is the same set of companies, while they have some of their largest user bases, typically in the top three worldwide in India, draw relatively piddly amounts of revenue. Right? And that's fundamentally because Indians at scale don't have money to spend. And so what we've been thinking about is, can we invert this entire equation? Where uh, earlier on, data was used to sell things to the user. But instead, can we give users control over their data so that they're now empowered to access better financial services, like accessing a low-cost loan offer and the like? And that can only happen uh, with consent. Right? Uh, currently, the mechanism for sharing of data is completely broken. I mean, we live in 2019 in this day and age of tech. And really, globally, the worldwide predominant method of financial data sharing is through a method called screen scraping. So users give out their username and password, and third-party service providers, bots, log in and scrape that data. Right? Extremely historic. Prehistoric, rather. <laughs> or you'll get sent to download a PDF uh, uh, through, or take a printout, right? or get sent to the bank branch. Recently, I was applying for a visa. I had to physically go to a bank branch, get six months printout, get it stamped, uh, and then send it to the consulate. Right? I could have easily, the data was digitally available. And in a much more trustworthy, low-cost manner, I could have given consent for it to be shared uh, directly. Right? And this is expensive both for me as a user, as well as for the bank or the financial institution that's involved. And so we applied the same design pattern that's made UPI successful, where basically in UPI we decoupled the custodian of the account and the app through which you give permission. Right? So in the old world, you actually went to your bank, for example, and gave permission by producing a check or logging in through your net banking portal to deduct money from your account. Right? In the new paradigm, you can go to a third party app like PhonePay, WhatsApp, Paytm, or any app of your choice and give permission. But these apps don't sit on the money flow. Right? The money remains sitting in your bank account. And when you give permission, uh, uh, that permission artifact gets uh, digitally signed. And then your money gets transferred from your destination, from your bank account to the corresponding destination account. Right? And so we decided to apply the same principle to data sharing. So generalized a bit and said, can data remain at your source accounts? But could you go to third party applications to give permission and manage your consent? And that's very important given the dynamics of a country like India, especially when we're talking about a billion plus people with our diversity. You need multiple applications out there in the market serving specific needs of customers and not just one. So in a country like Estonia with a homogeneous population and relatively small numbers, you could have a single portal provided by the government to do this. In a country like India, you've got to involve market participants that can build much more diverse, multilingual, and so on experiences for users to manage consent. 
And, and, and just for context, I mean, because data is relatively an abstract word, uh, the, cat, the way we categorize data is really into six types. Um, on, on the left, what you see is really on one end of the spectrum, secret data. So think of this like your passwords, the biometrics you submitted to Aadhaar, your PIN, UPI PIN, et cetera. And these are essentially non-shareable, right? So you don't share this with anyone. On the other end, you've got open data sets, what's available on data.gov.in, uh, high level aggregate statistics of an economy, and so on and so forth. Um, in the middle, and what we're really concerned about uh, today is you've got personal data, which is like your KYC information, driver's license, mark sheet. You've got user-generated data, which is essentially data that you directly generate on interaction with any of the platforms. For example, when you swipe a card at a POS terminal, a credit debit is directly generated on your transaction statement. Or if any of you use some of the faster keyboard typing apps, uh, SDKs, uh, 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 the keyword inputs that you give are user-generated data. Right? And then companies take this user-generated data, apply their algorithms, and come up with insights. And that essentially is what we categorize as derived data sets. So a perfect example is a credit bureau taking your raw transaction data that you generated and then applying their different models and coming up with a credit score. Right? Or the, the same as your personalized keyboard dictionary, so on and so forth. And, and the last category is anonymous data sets, which is especially relevant for folks on the machine learning side, because if, if especially India needs to become competitive, uh, we must have the ability to put out anonymized data sets into the market uh, uh, that are sufficiently, uh, that cannot be de-anonymized to a reasonable degree, so that market participants can go ahead and build out competitive ML models. Uh, and what we've done over the past almost three, four years that we started work on the consent framework is thought about it in the context of personal and derived data, uh, personal and user-generated data. Uh, derived data is left to market participants itself, and, and that's really a competitive strength. In order to do that, the first step was actually standardizing consent. And so in 2016, the Ministry of IT published a national standard for electronic consent. Uh, the way we think about consent, so the typical way most people think about consent is consent to collect. So essentially when you download an application uh, uh, on your mobile app, it asks you for a bunch of permissions to collect either your SMS history, your call logs, so on and so forth, right? And uh, you either approve or disapprove. We are not bothered really about solving for that. While that can be made more informed, so on and so forth. Essentially what we're saying is once an application has collected user data, for example, a bank has collected different transactional data of mine, I must have a secure privacy preserving mechanism for me to subsequently share that with any other service provider. So the consent artifact that you see out here is primarily designed to address consent for sharing. And it's based on a set of principles we call organs. So O and organ stands for, it's an open standard. Um, and anyone can Google electronic consent framework and you'll find it. Um, R is, it's revocable. Uh, so I can give someone consent every month for the next six months and then go ahead and revoke it. G is, like you notice, the consent is very granular. So technically, I can give a user, I can give an application consent for a particular row and column of my transaction data, right? Or let's say, as a lender, all you want to know is, does the user have a minimum asset value greater than 10,000? So instead of the user having to share his entire transaction statement, which is much more privacy revealing, the user could actually share the output of this query, which says a simple yes or no. Um, the A in organ stands for auditable, so structured audit logs are generated every time consents created, data is shared, etc. Uh, the N stands for notice. So just like when money leaves your account, you get notified through an SMS or email. In the new paradigm, when data is shared about you, you will get notified like, hey, SBI Bank has now shared your data uh, with this corresponding lender through this corresponding consent manager. And S is, stands for basically it's end-to-end -end secure. We've implemented a bunch of end-to-end -end encryption protocols. Now this consent artifact that you look at essentially becomes the technology backbone for uh, uh, the entire consent framework. And so the next question is, the user must have the ability to go to some institution to generate this XML file. 
very simplistically put, right? And so in the latter part of 2016 is where the four financial sector regulators, uh, RBI, which is our central bank, SEBI, which regulates the securities market, PFRDA, which looks at pension funds, and IRDA, which looks at insurance, collectively came together at the FSDC level, which is uh, apex interregulatory body driven by the Ministry of Finance, and decided to adopt the consent artifact and create a new class of institutions known as data access fiduciaries. And the first instantiation of a data access fiduciary is the NBFC account aggregator. So essentially, RBI was put in the, license, in the driving seat of licensing and regulating uh, uh, these new class of institutions where users could go manage their consent, link their different data provider accounts. And this same set of principles is largely what's reflected in India's draft uh, data protection bill. So once the Supreme Court established that Indians have a right to privacy, uh, they had instructed the government to go ahead and form a committee to draft a privacy bill, which came to be known as the Shri Krishna Committee. The Shri Krishna Committee recently published the draft of its privacy bill. And if you look at it in the context of this ecosystem, there are really two relevant parts. One, consent is the bedrock of that bill. And so it makes it very clear that unconsented flows of data will be illegal. And second, it establishes a right to data portability. And so every citizen now has a right to port their data from one service provider to another in a machine-readable, structured manner. Uh, uh, and these have been enshrined in the bill itself. Now, the EU also has a right to data portability. However, what the EU lacks is the underlying technological layer to enforce it and bring it to life, which is why they've been struggling over the past few years, uh, especially off late with the implementation of GDPR. In India, what you may have noticed is uh, 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 the ecosystem has been taking a techno-legal approach. Uh, UPI is a perfect example of the government putting out a cashless India policy and then building out a technology backbone through NPCI to make that happen. Uh, Aadhaar was nothing but the technology backbone for the direct benefits transfer policy. And the electronic consent framework becomes a technology backbone for India's going forward data protection bill. And the way it works is your data remains at source, right? And I'll, I'll probably draw a quick uh, overview of the ecosystem. So we've got the user out here, which may be an individual or a small business. Can everyone see? Or like, or any enterprise really, because enterprises also have data. Then you've got on the left, essentially data providers or what the policy calls financial information providers. This is where customer data resides. So it might be a bank, a depository, uh, a mutu mutual fund, a stock exchange, uh, a insurance repository. So almost the entire gamut of asset information is already covered uh, across the four sectors under the account aggregator master directive by RBI. Uh, you've then got on the right financial information users. Essentially, these are a class of entities registered or regulated by one of the four FSRs. So if you're an NBFC lender, you're a registered investment advisor, you're a bank, all of these get categorized as FIUs who want access to customers' data in order to give them a service, right? So a lender wants access to your bank account statements and other borrowings to give you a loan, right? And in the current paradigm, you either go to the FIU and give out your username and password, and the FIU through a third-party service screen scrapes it or the FIU sends you running around to each of the FIPs physically or digitally, right, and download or print out that transaction statement, build up that file, and give it back to the FIU, right? And so with the introduction of the account aggregators, which are an NBFC class of institutions, and there'll be multiple of them. In fact, as things stand, five account aggregators have already been issued an in-principle approval, uh, uh, and almost four of them are in a good state of readiness uh, and operationalizing as we speak. Uh, a user can now go to an account aggregator, register. Uh, so in order to register, it's a simple, think of it like a mobile OTP flow, right? And you'll get an AAID, which might be, say, shubham at shubham, wait, yeah at AA, right? Uh, so very similar to the UPI ID, right? And then you can go ahead and link the accounts that reside with the different financial information providers. And these APIs have already been standardized. So the APIs as an FIP, as an account aggregator, or as an FIU have already been standardized and are available on api.rebit.org 
dot in. And in fact, the financial information, so what does a machine readable version of your bank account statement, what does a machine readable version of your NPS balance, a machine readable version of your mutual fund unit look like, has also been standardized and made available on the same URL slash schema. Now a user can go to an AA, get their AA ID, link their different accounts, and now they could go to a lender, right? And give their, the lender says, hey, in order to give you a loan, I need access to your data. Uh, and in order to give access to your data, could you please give me an AA ID? And so the user gives his AA ID, Shubham at AA. And how many of you have experienced a UPI collect request? Where you give someone your UPI ID and you got a collect request for money? Almost 80, 90% of you, right? Now basically we've generalized that and you can now get a consent request for your data on an AA application, right? So you give your AA ID and then in real time on your AA application you get a notification and out pops up a consent request saying, hey, this FIU wants access to this data for this time period, uh, for this data life, and it kind of meets with most of the principles uh, which, which rely on informed consent, and you can either approve or deny it. And if you approve it, uh, digitally sign consent artifacts, the standard that I showed you in the previous slide, are created by the AA. It's then taken to each of the FIPs, and then they will verify and validate the consent artifact, then fetch the, if it's valid, they'll fetch the data from their internal systems, digitally sign it so that downstream trust is maintained, and then encrypt it. So we've actually implemented an end-to-end -end encryption protocol, much like if you take a look at Telegram or WhatsApp, right? They broker the message for you, uh, 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 but it's actually end-to-end -end encrypted and only gets decrypted in your trusted client. So the FIP encrypts the data and then sends it to the AA, who will then forward it to the FIU or as some use cases to the customer directly, uh, where the customer decides to go to an AA app and just download a local copy of his data to subsequently maybe push to Google Drive or DigiLocker, wherever, right? And so not only can the AAs not see the data, uh, but they also cannot store it, uh, and the policy prohibits storage of data. So they're nothing but, in some ways, like a postman. So they go, they give the envelope to the FIP, FIP puts in data, seals the envelope, gives it back to the AA, who hands it over to the, the end destination. Uh, so that's kind of the broad overview of the consent and data flows. Uh, some of the folks had questions on what would the money flows look like, or roughly what would be the business model uh, uh, of some of these account aggregators, right? And I've, I've noticed quite a bit of healthy skepticism around that. But broadly, there are a few. Uh, one is some set of account aggregators may firstly, at a very high level, focus on individual customers, right? Uh, uh, but a new set of account aggregators may actually focus on enterprises, right? Because enterprises also have data and they also need to manage consent. So for example, GST becomes an enterprise data set, right? So at a high level, you'll have AAs that focus on the retail consumer side or either on the enterprise and that corresponding segment, right? Some AAs may focus again on either self-service modes of consent, which may think, we may think of as India One, right? So they'll hand out an application and then users can download it and, and proceed to go ahead and manage their consent. But some AAs may actually go into India 2 and India 3 and actually partner with, say, business correspondents and others, because one of the predominant user experience in India is actually assisted flows, right? And so new class of AAs may actually focus on how do you give informed consent in an assisted manner, right? And again, given the diversity of India, what might be informed to you may not be informed to me, and so we expect a different set of user experiences out here. And, and broadly, if you look at the ecosystem of the five that have been approved, uh, uh, one is NADL, which is funded mostly by public sector banks. Then we've got Aditya Billa. Uh, you've got two startups, uh, which is One Money and FinView. And then we've also got uh, uh, CAMS, which, is, which operates in the security space. Uh, and we expect many more approvals to give out. So this is really going to be a very competitive market ecosystem. And at a very high level so far, the way we see the money flows being shaped is on the FIP's end, because they are running a server to fetch data and serve it, uh, there must be some uh, sustainable way for them to recover their costs. Broadly, that would work through an ATM-like pricing model, where they'll say the first end transactions are free, and after that, we would charge you, and they will charge the customer. 
Also, if you zoom out on the balance sheet of FIPs, right, and the picture that I showed you earlier, today they're serving data requests physically through a bank branch and so on and so forth. And that's actually very expensive. So as more data requests move digitally, that actually directly improves their bottom line by helping them save costs. Then on the AAs, between the AA and FIP, it's going to be free. And, and, and the reason for that is you want interoperability. So any account, authorized account aggregator can talk to any authorized financial information provider, right? Because we, what we don't want is exclusive contracts forming between an AA and an FIP. So let's say AA1 partners with SPI, AA2 partners with Kotak, AA3 partners exclusively with, say, ICICI. And if the user has accounts in SBI and ICICI, poor users to run around to two AAs. Right? So just like UPI, where the banks are interoperable, out here all FIPs are interoperable and can talk to any authorized account aggregator. Then for the AA, uh, again, a range of reasons why they may decide to become an AA. Uh, one could be very strategic. So large consumer internet players actually look at controlling the customer experience and hence, uh, 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 just like they went down the path on payments, they may go down the similar, because payments is nothing but an app through which you give permission. AAs are nothing but an app through which you give permission but for your data. And so there are a set of folks that are looking at it from that strategic perspective. However, a set of AAs may decide to also charge customers directly. So I may decide to build a very privacy friendly AA, think of it like, uh, you have this email service, I think Thunderbird or something like that, uh, 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 where they actually charge you for email, but they offer a whole bunch of end-to-end -end encryption and other privacy guarantees, right? And just like in the uh, 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 security space where you have high net worth in individuals deciding to pay a fee-based model to wealth advisors because that ensures appropriate incentive alignment, some AAs will say we'll only charge the customer and earn money from you, and hence we are best aligned in your interest, and we'll not earn money from FIUs, right? But there's also a large segment of India that can't afford to pay, right? And hence, those set, for those set, AAs may earn money from FIUs, similar to the distributor broker commission model, right? And keep it free for the customer. Now, of course, AAs cannot discriminate between customers. So they cannot say for customer A for this transaction statement to FIU1, I will charge X. But for customer B for the same transaction statement to the same FIU, I will charge 10X, right? So they cannot discriminate between customers. And they also cannot discriminate between FIUs uh, for the same customer and type of data, right? Uh, so that's kind of a broad overview of how the money flows would shape up. Uh, uh, and the technical standard that's available on api.rabbit.org.in kind of outlines what the consent and data flows would look like. Uh, if anyone has any questions out here, I'm, I'm happy to take them uh, on the framework. So are accounts across different A's interoperable? I mean, for example, if you have a bank account and you use any UBI app, you can just have uh, your phone number ODB link and you can transfer funds from multiple accounts. So, for example, if you're applying for a loan on Flexi Loans, right, they, they, they would ask you for your PPA account aggregator. So, if you have an uh, account uh, address with any of these five A's, you can just enter it. Does Flexi Loans have to have an integration with all of these five no. account aggregators? No. So, because we've standardized the APIs on the AA end, right, as well as the endpoint for an FIU to receive data, uh, and a user can go to an FIU, give any AA ID of their choice, and the FIU can then send that request to any corresponding AA. So uh, these FIUs have to have integration? It's not an integration because the API has been standardized and a very nuanced technical detail is there is a registry which has FIPs, AAs, and FIUs and corresponding digital certificates and domain names and other security profile related things. So think of it like DNS in some ways. And hence, through the registry, uh, it becomes interoperable for the FIU to send that request. It's very similar to Bluetooth. So in Bluetooth, you, your Bluetooth device implements a standardized interface, gets certified against that. And that's interoperable across any Android, iOS, any other device in a non-discriminatory manner. And you're not actually laying out connections or pipes of any sort. FIUs need to be registered as well. Yes, so as per the current policy, FIUs are any entity registered or regulated by one of the four financial sector regulators. So banks, NBFCs, registered investment advisors, brokers, the, that entire gamut, right? And uh, over a period of time, we do expect it to open up, right? Uh, and, and that's what the draft 
data protection bill uh, signals because if I have a citizen has a right to data portability, I should be able to port my data from any service provider on one end to any other, whether they're regulated or unregulated. And really, if you look at open banking, there are two parts, payments and data, right? On the payment side, India rolled out UPI. There are appropriate nudges for people to come on board, right? So the regulators will nudge, and the AA master directive is a nudge by the uh, four financial sector regulators and the Ministry of Finance to bring this to life, right? And there are different types of regulatory nudges that would come in, right? But no mandate of any sort. And UPI went through the same story. And uh, uh, without an exceptional mandate, uh, you've gone ahead 880 million transactions last month, uh, five banks at pilot, 20 at launch, 100 within a year, right? So I think it's very important that. Uh, uh, in fact, we don't mandate this, otherwise what will happen is the ecosystem will settle on a very low level equilibrium where FIPs would come on board more from a point of view of compliance and not think through deeply what are the new types of FIU use cases because a lot of FIPs are FIUs and there's something called the principle of reciprocity. And so unless you be an FIP, you cannot be an FIU. The same principle of reciprocity occurs in the case of UPI where unless, uh, if you want to be an acquirer, you have to be an issuer or Krillic, which is RBI's database above five crores, unless you report data, you can't access it. So especially in the banking system, uh, principle of reciprocity is a very well-established principle. And so for a lot of the FIPs, which are major banks, they also are FIUs. And they're highly incentivized to now access data through this framework. And that's why they're coming on board as FIPs, right? And so therefore, I'm of the opinion that mandates uh, 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 would only kind of destroy the ecosystem, not achieve much. Um, on the point of view of uh, probably the market architecture, essentially what DEPA uh, uh, is doing is democratizing access to data completely, right? Uh, so just like human, UPI democratized access to payments and hence shaped, uh, shaped innovation towards the layers above, which are new financial products, which are essentially what India needs, DEPA is doing the same for data, right? So no longer can you rent seek uh, purely by, because you had a hoard of raw customer data. Right? So you're forced to move from the raw data layer towards predictions, better decisions, and eventually better judgments on that data as a market participant. Right? And, and we, we expect this to evolve. So while this currently includes all asset information about a user, uh, through what's called uh, the public credit registry, which will be a real-time registry of all credit contracts in the country, uh, which has now been approved by RBI, and about a year from now, we should see it come to life. Uh, and you can Google this. Uh, there's a high-level task force report published. But very simply, if we go back to the Rajini story, if she's taking a loan for a day, you must be able to, as a lender, report that you've given this loan to Rajini, right? And so that otherwise what would happen is Rajini will take out a loan for a day with the current reporting cycle with anywhere between two to three months, right? Uh, she's going to go to multiple play players, take out multiple loans, and go into over indebtedness, right? So if you want to move towards lower tenure loans, which are one way to reduce the risk factor, we must have the ability to report data in near real time as much as possible. And that's basically what the PCR is doing. So it will just be a raw registry, no scoring of any sorts. That is left again to market participants. Uh, uh, but it also implements the consent framework. And so tomorrow, as a user, I could go to an account aggregator uh, and then link my PCR account and then share not only my assets but my liabilities uh, with, let's say, an investment advisor who will be able to give me much more holistic advice. And this is also rolling out, for example, for the likes of SME data sets like GSTN and CBDT. Uh, uh, so your GST profile, GST returns, outward supplies, e-way bills, and the like uh, would now be implementing the consent framework. Uh, and TRI has already adopted this for telecom data. Uh, uh, so if you see the output of their privacy consultation, which they did a few months back, they make a recommendation to actually implement the consent framework uh, for all telecom data, which is often the first data set available uh, uh, to new to credit customers, typically the prepaid recharge history and your call data records. right? And they, what they've said is to go ahead and impanel existing RBI regulated account aggregators to get started till they figure out who their appropriate data access fiduciary would be. So basically, over a period of time and in a very phased-wise manner, uh, much more data sets will come on board. Uh, and if you really categorize by governance it into three types, that is government data, regulated data, and private data sets, government data sets are already being made available through the DigiLocker. 
right? And so there are about few billion documents like your driver's license, mark sheet, LPG certificates, CBSE, ICSE mark sheets, et cetera, being made available. And there's a systematic effort to digitize more government data sets and make that available through DigiLocker. And in DigiLocker 2.0, they will have a similar consent request flow. So there'll be a data access fiduciary for government data. On the regulated data set, which is essentially finance, health, telecom, uh, education skills, typically these are socioeconomically most important to the user. They will be implementing a framework like the account aggregator, right? And then the private data sets, which might be social media data, your Uber, Ola, ride history, etc. One would have to wait for the Shri Krishna bill to get passed. Uh, probably post elections uh, uh, before that gets any coverage, right? But the regulated data sets don't really, uh, can already roll out as is because the sectoral regulators have the authority, uh, TRI, SEBI, uh, RBI, et cetera, uh, to prescribe uh, relevant rules to the market participants without having that to go through uh, uh, an entire round of parliament. So, so that's kind of how it would evolve, right? And in terms of market participants, I mean, the, the market architecture, the way it would shift, is while a lot of value creation is now going to happen on the FIU, right? So you can now expect hundreds of PFM apps because that will be the lowest hanging fruit in the market. Today we have one or two, and quite crappy to be honest. But uh, you can expect hundreds of PFM apps and the like. So what we do expect is now a new class of FIUs. One is it's going to become much more competitive, right? Because value shifts from any basic service you provided on the raw data to what was the quality of predictions, insights, judgments, and hence the out final financial product you're giving to the user. Second, you'd expect a new class of, say, business decision providers, maybe what Inmobi is doing uh, through the open data initiative, right? You'll have a new class of prediction service providers. Probably I'd categorize Credit Vidya in that. Um, uh, you'll also have credit bureaus and credit rating agencies shifting from just being raw data providers to actually offering better scores that are much more meaningful to lenders, right? You'll have also, of course, the data access fiduciary or the consent manager. Uh, you'll have data governance players because what we've noticed is as this framework rolls out, uh, consuming the data on the FIU end requires a whole new set of governance because now the data comes attached with a consent which is very granular, right? And hence FIUs need a new set of tools to manage that data in an appropriate manner and the entire data life cycle, right? What data can feed into what machine learning model if a user says right to forget, how does that affect the entire tech stack, right? And so you'll have a whole bunch of tool companies now coming in and in fact for few of the folks out here should already start building uh, so that it makes it all the more easy for FIUs to consume that data in a safe, secure manner. And, and to your question of the rollout, I mean, uh, we've been at this for about four years, four or five years, and it's taken a long time because there's actually no other parallel anywhere else in the world uh, of uh, data democratization at this scale. Uh, so it required a lot of first principles thinking. So since the consent framework and the account aggregator came out in 2016, you have noticed a long gap Right? And again, there was a bunch of skepticism about this is not happening. But actually, in that quietness is where we were working first on fleshing out the technical standards on how these flows would look like. That subsequently came out in about mid-2018. Uh, the Reserve Bank of India issued the in-principle approvals towards the end of 2017 and 2018, mid-2018, which is when the account aggregator started to get ready. And uh, in the past few months now, about four of them are in a good state of readiness, which is where they've now started to plug into banks. And so about a month back, I mean, uh, Venkat from Kotak Bank is sitting here. They've been one of the first few adopters on this framework, right? A month back, I had a meeting with Rajneesh of SBI, um, um, Amitabh of Access, where they have IDFC first, where we got a commitment of end June, they're gonna go live on the system, both as an FIP and as an FIU, essentially rolling it out to about 1,000 to 5,000 employees. And then we're looking at an end September public launch. Um, and, and the picture here was taken, I mean, this was about two days back when I was in Bombay, and SBI has kind of mobilized its entire army uh, to meet the end June deadline, uh, where they'll onboard as an FIP, and the FIU use case would be on their Yono application. So the way we see it is basically um, by about end June, early July, we'll have five of the major financial institutions on board uh, who've already rolled it out to their employees. Kotak Bank's already plugged in with a few of the AAs. ICICI Bank has rolled it out to their employees as we speak. SBI Access and a few others are already in the pipeline. So most of the market leaders really should be on board by about end June. Um, and then about end September, you should have about 20 odd 
financial institutions as part of the public launch, and then just like UPI, maybe 100 within a year. Uh, that's kind of in terms of adoption uh, uh, where, where we are, right? And so most of the value creation is going to be when people get involved uh, in the messiness of the infrastructure at this stage, right? A lot of people have stayed away because they're like, this is not happening, I can't see any outward action, uh, I'm not able to understand the tech standards, blah, 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 right? But uh, the way we see it is really the next set of billion dollar companies uh, uh, would actually come about. I mean, because a screen scraping company like Plaid is able to raise a few hundred million at, at uh, a little over a billion dollar valuation, uh, and all they do is screen scraping, which is historic technology. Right? Uh, uh, so we expect a lot of value creation to happen through this framework, uh, but it's important that you jump in now and get kind of with the mentality that it's going to be messy, there's going to be regulatory uncertainty here and there, there's going to be technological messiness. Uh, 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 but if you delight in that, then you kind of would be successful. Uh, I'll just show you a quick demo of one of the account aggregators. This is not the FIU flow, which I spoke about earlier, but really the customer registering and then deciding to download data on his own, and that gets decrypted in his trusted client. So he's basically linking his accounts at this stage, uh, and linking could be a simple OTP-based flow, or you get redirected to the FIP and authenticate yourself in their domain. And now he's generating consent to fetch his data locally in his mobile phone. And, and there you see it. So it's getting decrypted in the trusted client of the mobile app itself, much like, say, Telegram or WhatsApp. And you can also go and view a log and manage your consent. So if you've given consent for the future or any form of recurring consent, you can go back and revoke it. And these are still early prototypes that are just rolling out in the market. So uh, uh, the way I'd pay attention to is much more the part of the infrastructure and then uh, uh, not so much on the UI and UX, really. Yeah. So uh, I was reading this website, and the account aggregators have to be KYC of these customers No. Uh, where did you read that? So on the NED, there was a that they tend to have RFP that they put Yeah. Uh, so the question is, do account aggregators have to do KYC? The answer is no. Uh, they obviously do have to identify the customer, which you see, and reference really the account aggregator master directive by RBI, uh, uh, particularly, because that's the only source of truth. Uh, and so that talks about customer identification and a simple mobile binding flow, that is a user registers over a mobile OTP is good enough. Because what's very important to understand is these are all read-only transactions. And hence, the security profile out here is very different from write-only, which may exist, say, when you use a payment app and you're actually making write transactions. So given that these are read-only, right, and then you authenticate with the FIP, and on the FIP side, you've already done KYC, so there's really no need of it. Um, I have two questions. And the first one is uh, related to the uh, account aggregator. You said the data is actually encrypted during the flow, uh, so by definition, account aggregators cannot process or store the data. So it also means that they cannot aggregate the data across the banks. So what it means is that only the user has that visibility. Am I right? No. So uh, uh, the way the account aggregators and the extent of aggregation that they do can happen once it's decrypted in the user's trusted client, right? So it's end-to-end -end encrypted. But then once it gets decrypted in the trusted client of my mobile app, uh, then I can do all sorts of visualization and different things to that. Of course, the limitation is you're limited by the compute capacity available on that phone. And so you cannot do, say, complex underwriting and like high-level machine learning models. Uh, 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 but uh, limited minus that, most of the aggregation, basic consolidation, like you saw on the AA out here, can be done in the app in the trusted client. And the trusted client does not have access to the server. Uh, Follow-up question to that. If so, what's the difference between an FIU and an account, account aggregator? I thought the value that the account aggregator is giving is an intermediary. Yeah, so we specifically designed for users to have uh, an account with a data access fiduciary, of which the AA for financial data is one of them, and not meant to be a pure pass-through like payment gateways. The reason being, as data gets opened up and democratized, that means users, once they get control, are going to give consent, consent in multiple places, which is why, unlike the EU, 
and some of the EU countries are actually underway to implement this as GDPR 2.0 because in the EU you give consent on the FIU side and that inherently creates a conflict right the, the issues you see with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica today is if I'm a product manager sitting in an FIU right what's going to happen is I'm incentivized to collect as much data and hence I'm not going to make as much informed consent screens as much as possible right so by decoupling that and creating specialized institutions that do account aggregator functionality the user now has a chance and you have specialized institutions focused on creating informed consent so as much as possible we prevent situations related to over consenting which will ultimately bring down the entire framework um, uh, but of course when you look at it on a larger picture uh, an a is an independent subsidiary but some folks may have uh, an FIU subsidiary and stuff like that, but as long as they follow the appropriate governance and interoperability norms, uh, that's okay. Normally, what happens for a for a loan provider is that they want more data than what is available as a snapshot. So what you are providing is a snapshot view of my uh, banking saving data current uh, current account information. Um, does this complete information? all the way to the FIU or it's the snapshot? No, it's whatever the user consented to. And so the framework fundamentally supports granular transaction data. I don't know how you define snapshot, but basically every single credit and debit in my account, which becomes part of a transaction statement, I can choose an appropriate duration and give consent for that. I may, however, give consent to a query on top of that transaction statement, which may be, in your words, a snapshot total assets balance as of this date, et cetera. That is also possible, but I can also give access to the granular transaction statement. And again, that's where the AAs can innovate. So they can say for this purpose, right? So FIU is asking data for a particular purpose, and he decides to ask for typically a loan you ask for five years, a, a malicious FIU asks for 10 years of data, let's say hypothetically. That's where the AA can pop a notification to the user saying, hey, maybe you should reconsider your decision because typically for this purpose you grant five years now it's asking for ten right i'm just thinking out hypothetically or also the a could show what the draft Sri krishna bill talks about which is trust scores right so every fiu uh, would get audited and assigned a trust score much like you have say bharat emission standards or uh, whenever you buy an electronic appliance out of five stars, it shows you in a very consumable manner three, four, five, right? Otherwise, typical users can't do complex calculations. And so you can imagine a similar rating once uh, implemented, operationalized on the AA end, right? And so this can be now saying the AA shows this is a three star FIU, this is a five star, and that would incentivize better behavior. Uh, so those are some of the ways as well AAs could innovate. And it's also true that, that the FIPs will have to give us a larger window to customers data. I mean typically savings account window is three months in a, in a typical bank. Yeah, so they would give it for a few years and the procedural guidelines of, uh, 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 post the pilot, we will figure out what that optimum n number of years is. And the way we see it is uh, obviously a human on average may live for around 70 years, right? And so say if you open an account, uh, you have an active financial life for say at least 50 years, right? So it's quite likely FIPs are not going to give you 50 years data because that would have been stored in some disk, etc. And so we do expect vault service providers to come up, which might be a DigiLocker or, uh, 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 for example, their products like DigiMe or what, what the MIT team uh, recently moved out of MIT, the solid project run by Tim Berners-Lee, et cetera, which are these personal data stores. And so a user can now set up a recurring consent saying, pull my transaction statement every month and just push it to my vault, right, where it's securely stored for a much longer term period. Uh, uh, and that's the way you'll address going forward uh, lack of very historic data available on the FIP, right? But also, very practically, most of the models today do not require, I mean, you need last, say, five years data and stuff like that, but not last 50 years, so, so that's how it is, yeah. So his question was, is it only for individuals and not for enterprises? Uh, that's incorrect. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, some account aggregators can focus on enterprises. The nuance there is you have to build out authorization workflows, right? Because who in an enterprise can give consent? In the case of an individual, it's very clear one-to-one -one mapping, right? Or it could also be multi-stakeholder accounts, which would be, say, 
uh, a joint account and the like, right? And when GST goes live, in fact, they're, they're implementing the sandbox as we speak, that's an example of an enterprise data set, right? And so that's, that's the way enterprises would come on board. Hey, I'm just going back to your point regarding uh, you know, reciprocity, that FIPs will not become FIPs until you know, they agree to become FIPs, right? So that's okay, but going back to your point about business model, about you know, that they will charge, let's say, they charge fees and agent fees, is there a plan to cap that fees? His question was basically uh, FIPs. Uh, uh, must become FIPs if they want to be FIUs. That's a principle of reciprocity. And uh, is there going to be a cap on the uh, fee they may charge as FIPs? Uh, uh, firstly, just before I answer the cap question, um, um, in the banking sector, the principle of reciprocity exists. Uh, there is a nuance in the securities ecosystem uh, because if you look at the FIPs in the securities ecosystem, which are typically depositories, RTA, stock exchanges, they don't have a customer facing end, uh, which would typically be your registered investment advisors and the like, right? So in the securities ecosystem, the FIUs, would, which would be a registered investment advisor, versus FIPs would be depositories, and depositories are not interested in becoming investment advisors, right? Uh, uh, and most of your transactions get logged at the stock exchange and depository end and not on the FIU end. So there are some nuances as we talk about a very cross-sectoral thing, but largely in banking, the principle of reciprocity exists. Uh, uh, and really, if you have data, then you have to share it. In the case of securities, these RIAs don't have data because it anyways gets logged with depositories and the like, so it doesn't make sense. On your question of it being capped, yes, uh, because it's a regulated ecosystem, once appropriate, uh, equilibrium of the transactions is found. So in the early days, it's going to be free, at least for the next two to three years, right? And then once we find, okay, this is the equilibrium of user behavior, these are the n number of transactions, typically that a user would transact, then based on that, an appropriate cap can be uh, uh, put in place. Like I said, these, this is operating in the regulated sector under the eyes of RBI and other sectoral regulators. So. Um, uh, uh, if, if it exceeds as well and they charge too high, then they will step in. But you don't want to step in too early, which is why that's, that's not the case. Hi, I have a couple of questions. The first one is you mentioned that there will be some sort of school implementation in that uh, you can revoke your consent or after, let's say, 10 years, the consent will expire or anything. But is there also a purpose limitation, which is that if an FIU has taken data for one purpose, they cannot use it for another? Yes, so that's uh, so there are two ways to look at it. Again, techno and legal, two layers. It's important that the technological framework enforces purpose. And if I go back to the consent framework, what you see out there is is purpose purpose code. Right, so you can see loan, etc. So the user is now able to grant consent. Attached to it is a specific purpose, and this purpose comes in when either the customer asks for his data or customer asks for it to be sent to the FIU for the purpose of PFM wealth management, etc. Then you need the appropriate legal framework to come in place, which the purpose limitation exists in the Sri Krishna bill, right? And uh, this allows a way to enforce that. And uh, my second question is: uh, currently, a lot of FIPs, uh, especially with their generated data. They already have arrangements with uh, credit rating agencies or, or loan facilitation agencies. And, and they make, uh, as in that's a source of revenue for them. Now, under this AA model, what, what would be their incentive to share this data with through AAs? Through so they never share asset data. Uh, so you've got to separate assets and liabilities, and they have two different governance frameworks, because as society, we have two different norms for them. Asset data is your bank account statement. Liabilities data is your previous borrowings, for example. Right? Now, when you go, a credit bureau, and we as society have agreed that a credit bureau, for example, has a right uh, to maintain a log of all your borrowings, right? because otherwise, failure in credit markets will take place, primarily because of over-indebtedness. Right? However, bureaus do not maintain a repository of all your asset data. So when you apply for a loan, the lender has a right to look up your previous borrowings, but you declare your assets. You're incentivized to declare more, but they do not get your assets as a dump saying he owns all these properties and all these bank accounts by default. Right? It's, it's you who has that agency. So the account aggregator framework uh, initially covers asset data and provides a chance for that to be shared Right? The PCR uh, 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 addresses liabilities data, 
right? And essentially, PCR is relatable to the credit bureaus. Uh, and the reason PCR has come about is essentially to make uh, uh, real-time uh, reporting and access available uh, of every credit transaction so that we can drive down and create shorter tenure loan products. And then the credit bureaus will be shifted towards coming up with better scores, right? So that's kind of how it relates to each other. Is there any plan uh, to have the cash transaction data also in the data sets? Like a uh, person like Rajni would be earning in cash, she might be doing a lot of cash transactions rather than she can do. No, in fact, over a period of time, she will move digital, right? And uh, 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 as UPI penetrates more and more, and an actual incentive is she can now get access to credit. If she shows uh, a non-repudiable data trail, she's now incentivized uh, 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 to make a digital transaction, right? So, so, so cash is obviously out, uh, uh, but there are appropriate incentives, what a bunch of lenders and banks are working on, which is give access to credit, which makes her uh, uh, jump on board the digital bank wagon. Okay, there are, uh, like, for, for GSC and there are GSC and service providers who are already providing the data for the GSC bills and, uh, so they, they will be coming with the data to the category of account aggregators or, uh, because there are already, they are, they are doing a subset of data providing. Uh, yeah, so, but the GSPs itself uh, were, were not designed fundamentally to do consent management. Right? And they were designed to really be an interface for right transactions, which was instead of going to a GST portal, I could go to a GSP app of my choice, tally, et cetera, right? and then file my returns and stuff like that. Uh, versus the account aggregators are very specifically designed uh, for managing your consent. The data flows end to end encrypted. So we get into the specifics. In the case of GSP, since the flow is not encrypted, if you share it, GSP onwards, the GSP can read it. Uh, there's also a timeout of 30 minutes. I mean, I don't want to dive too deep, but uh, the AA system at a very high level is designed for data sharing from the ground up. GSPs are not, which is why. Uh, for the AA, is only a self service mode available, or can an AA also operate through an agent assisted mode to acquire customers and obtain consent? If, uh, yes, the uh, agent assisted mode is also available, what are the nuances to uh, authenticate the customer? No, so uh, in terms of the uh, 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 assisted mode of giving consent, right, uh, that's really left to the AAS to define, right, depending on how the uh, market dynamics are and are you partnering with CSEs, business correspondence, are you going to use a micro ATM possibly to authenticate, right, and so it's left right now open for the AAS uh, because it's still early days, so we don't want to be too prescriptive uh, uh, on that part. I have a question with regards to how uh, easy would the mechanism for uh, you know, consent providing be. Uh, so uh, the first case is one I would like. If you look at accessing uh, you know, GST returns uh, and that has been a subject of interest within the uh, financial services over the last one year, let's say to the existing uh, interfaces to GST returns. Uh, it has been, of course, uh, not an easy user experience because uh, as it access has to go through a process of API and everything. I will step back, what we see in the case of the AA framework is uh, you know, certainly an easy approach, much like uh, uh, content providing framework. Yeah, so it's still too early to be prescriptive on UI and UX. Uh, primarily because you need a first set of apps to go out into the market, uh, let customers adopt it. In the case of payments, it was easy. Uh, you could be slightly prescriptive. For example, you must show the payment amount, right? In this case, if you look at the consent framework, which has so many variables, if you show this to the user directly, he's going to get scared and run away, right? Now, what is the appropriate level of abstraction through which you show this to the user is now left to market participants to decide. So if one AA has a bad UX, don't go to him. Register with another AA who has a good UX. Maybe in the early days, all will have bad UX. Two years down the line, you'll have great UX coming in, right? So essentially, the way we look at it is how do you ensure that the ecosystem is designed to be competitive and in the long run get better and better? As more learnings come in uh, and certain things become uh, are necessary for the entire ecosystem to implement, then that could be like UI, UX, certain UI, UX elements. Uh, for example, say this data trust score, uh, hypothetically, could be prescribed through the procedural guidelines. It's too early at this stage to be prescriptive. So my question was not about how the PA app you know, provides the UX to the, uh, the uh, user. Uh, but really, those steps that you have to go through to really be able to make it consistent work. 
No, so like I said, GST was not optimized. Uh, and the GST and portal, I mean, the way we've designed the architecture of all these public platforms, UPI case in point is the government builds out infrastructure, right? They should not be building out front user facing applications, or if they want, they may build one, right? Which in this case is the GST and portal. But you allow GSPs to come in on top as a layer above and offer those good front ending user experiences, which in the case of GSPs might be tally. If you take UPI, you've got NPCI providing the public good a layer of banks which add resiliency on top, and then partner apps above that, right? And then partner apps uh, uh, actually create the differentiated user experiences. The A follows a similar model uh, itself. I will probably take the top line. Sure, sure. The, because the, the point is that a number of uh, lenders in the ecosystem have been trying to access the data. Uh, no, which is why I said case in point, uh, GSPs were not designed fundamentally for data sharing, uh, which is why it's getting plugged in through the AA. So whatever current methods you're doing are actually hacky, and a lot of it relies on screen scraping. So that's this this, this framework is designed from the uh, ground up to be an enabler to data sharing in an informed consent manner. But happy to discuss the uh, specifics later. I'll uh, say uh, two questions. One is around the the public credit registry is there. Uh, what is the governance model that is followed there? Like who owns and who manages that? And the second question is on the, the consent layer itself, right? How are constructs like uh, the rev revocability part or uh, even the purpose being enforced on the FIU side? Yeah, so on the first question, the PCR is owned by the central bank, the RBI. And I'd recommend you to read the RBI High Level Task Force report, which got published last year, uh, which has all the specifics on it. But yeah, fundamentally, right now, it's a department within RBI that would run it. Maybe later on, they may spin it off, but, but yeah. Uh, on your second question, uh, again, like I said to someone else asked it, it's a techno-legal approach. So first, the technology framework must support granularity, purpose-based data sharing, and all of that, which is what you saw and what you see, rather, in the consent artifact, right? Uh, and then subsequent enforcement on the FIU end uh, 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 requires them to comply with the terms of the consented data sharing. And that's actually an opportunity for a lot of people to build out data governance products. Because a lot of FIUs today uh, do not have appropriate governance mechanisms around their data access layers uh, through which these different uh, attributes could be enforced, like data life, data expiry, purpose. Only use it for loans, marketing team can't access it, right? And so that's actually an opportunity for people uh, uh, to build out these products uh, so that FIUs can actually consume it, because that is a genuine problem. And especially when it gets the legal mandate on FIUs to comply with the terms of consent gets higher and higher, they're going to be looking for solutions, which, based on my initial view of the market today, are not very strong. Yeah. Uh, so I have two related questions. And I'll start with the first one. So uh, looking at the FinView app, just spark the thought, which is that in my head, at least the concept of an account aggregator, despite the name, is more of a consent broker, right? Or a consent manager. Uh, but the FinView app also effectively does some rudimentary EFM type. Uh, you know, it has a it has an overview of all of your accounts and so on. It, it's more of an account aggregator than the app, opposed to a the consent manager layer is separate from that. But uh, at its core, do, as in, do you see the, the A as the first or the second, as in more of a consent manager, or is it all right for them to also offer? No, it's fundamentally more of a consent manager, right? And uh, you're offering a certain uh, uh, functionality of the metadata uh, uh, to the user just so that app is usable, right? Uh, and all of that's happening decrypted uh, in the trusted client of the user's app and not on the account aggregator servers itself, right? So hence, that's perfectly okay. But fundamentally, they are consent managers, consent brokers, uh, yeah. if you may call it, and uh, they're not FIUs, which is why they're separated. Absolutely. So then, then my follow-on question is, perhaps there should be some uh, limitation on what, uh, uh, I mean, how much an AA can actually do with that data, the extent to which they can process that data, even on your device. And secondly, when it comes to uh, the, the corporate structure, right? obviously the regulations won't permit uh, a, a company in the business of A to do anything else. They're legally yeah. prohibited yeah. from doing anything else. They can still be a subsidiary of yeah. an FIU, for example. Yeah. But then that sparks the next question, which is, you know, when it comes to uh, technically how these two get integrated, right? 
the at least to me fundamentally it seems like the good way to uh, you know for uh, the content manager to work is a bit like say the way android permissions work in the sense that when uh, when the os is asking you for permission for something it takes you out of the flow of what you're doing it takes you out of that app into a standardized screen yeah. like where it asks for that permission right and that is always the same and it takes you out of that and that act of, of forcing you out of that ux flow is a way to make sure that you pay attention and so the same is applicable to account aggregator as well so if you read the technical standard all interactions of consent management be it approval be it uh, a rejection etc have to happen on the environment of an account aggregator itself and so if you see i mean you can look at because again this is in the abstract uh, but what might be relatable is say the upi flows uh, 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 take a look at say the swiggy phone pay integration right now android os allows you uh, uh, in a much more seamless manner for the new app to show up, right? Uh, but all interactions are happening on the new app uh, and not on the app behind, which in this case is Swiggy. So right. the A framework follows the same model, which is all customer interactions have to happen on the account aggregator and not on the FIU. Right. So my only question is if the account aggregator can still be, say, an SDK inside of the FIU app, let's say that the FIU also has a subsidiary in the AA business. Right? And they, they might have a separate AA app as well. For those who don't want to use the FIU app, only want to use the AA app, they might have that. But if they're allowed to also integrate the AA functionality as, say, an SDK inside of their FIU app, then you can, I mean, larger FIUs can all set up AAs and effectively, uh, you know, defeat the idea of taking people out of that flow, you know, out of that FIU flow. Which is, I mean, perhaps it's an edge case, maybe I'm being paranoid, but you know, that's one thing perhaps we should think about. Sure, sure. Uh, just um, wanted to follow up on that question about purpose. So, what's what's going to be the status with regard to, like, say, access to trusted third parties, etc. So, when you say the purpose is for, say, loan, does that include R and D with making streamlining the loan function better or something like that? which in turn allows for data to be accessed by trusted third parties, etc. So under this model, does that not happen? Or? So it's really a function of the governance layer applicable to FIUs, right? And uh, whatever RBI is prescribed, which are appropriate data governance norms, when the Shri Krishna bill comes in, IT Act, uh, the FIUs have to read that and apply the consent in those terms. So the tech framework must support at a fundamental level encoding the purpose, right? Now, fundamentally for the FIU itself to follow that purpose uh, is left to the legal uh, domain. Uh, on the tech side, we've been seeing a few solutions. Uh, of course, one extreme is pure crypto environments where you say, uh, bring your code here, run all of that here, and hence we'll enforce pur purpose that's, that's mathematically provable, uh, but that's not scalable. Uh, but we've been looking at uh, uh, what uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee has been working on, uh, called the Solid Project, uh, as potentially a way uh, uh, for less data to leave the environment and then FIUs to consume it. Uh, you can also see uh, some versions of this in the Apple Health Kit, where data remains on your phone itself. If any third-party app accesses it, they're just referencing a variable, and then it shows up in the UI. That's possible because they control the OS. Uh, but if that's not possible, then you're left to whatever legal framework uh, governs the FIUs. So the question then is, is it possible for the user then to know exactly even if it's not possible to control it, at least to know where all or who all Absolutely. Is. So in these cases, uh, uh, and as it rolls out, we would have an appropriate map of purpose. And you can even have branched consent, right, which states, I give consent to this FIU for a lending purpose. But that's then shared subsequently with these three data processors with whom I have a contractual agreement. So as that evolves, the tech framework is very extensible. So when, when we meet that situation, then we can take that up. Whatever. But when an Aadhaar holder gives a photocopy of his 
I'm I'm in agreement with you. So, <laughs> uh, photocopies are obviously a much more privacy-revealing way of data sharing, and uh, uh, it's very difficult to enforce a lot of these in the physical world. Yeah. So, so th there's a dichotomy. I mean, if I go ahead and believe that in five years people will become digital. That's not gonna happen. No, they they already are, right? And so it's always going to be an evolution. I mean, just look at the YouTube stats. The number one YouTube channel most watched in the world, T series. The second is an Indian. The third is an Indian channel. So it's obviously going to evolve, right? As smartphones also percolate more and more. And then it's really a matter of incentives. If it's easier to use the digital platform, then why not? Uh, in some cases, again, what's very important is to understand the diversity of India. As you go to smaller cities, uh, in Policy. So, uh, I am a little pessimist here. Sure. Because the uh, Adhan application started back in 2011. It took Jio in 2015 to kind of start up the entire ecosystem. So, we actually. Regulatory compliances like making mandatory for telecom and so on and so forth to make EYC or EKYC or Adhan Absolutely. in use say right. So, when you say that the ecosystem will evolve by itself, I'm a little skeptical because UPI happened because demonetization happened and suddenly there was a surge of need of way to make transactions. Aadhaar became popular because Jio did what it did. Right? So when you say that the ecosystem will evolve by itself without having the regulatory mandate, no, it's already evolving like I told you and some of the largest financial institutions in India are adopting the framework. Uh, specific to your point of Aadhaar and UPI because we've, as the team, lived through it viscerally. Uh, UPI as well went through a long period of zero transactions, right? And uh, the reason being at that point in time, the market participants were not able to understand the power of the framework, right? And the banks had very crappy applications that were implemented, which is why even during the time of demo, uh, a question was, do you use one of the existing bank apps? Do you build out a new bank app? Uh, and that's how Beam was born to become a reference app to show people that, hey, this is actually possible, right? I remember during the time of the UPI launch itself, most people within the ecosystem, and I won't get into the specifics, five companies in Koramangla uh, uh, who had a chance uh, to become winners on UPI, only one is out here, which is uh, PhonePay, right? So it's really important, which is why we're doing this session out here, is at least a few of the folks from the ecosystem decide that now is a slightly messy time, but now's the time I'm going to get in and either build out my whole new set of FIU products, right, that, that get people to adopt it faster. KYC was the same. The EKYC API existed for years, right? Uh, market participants, and we had actually evangelized it with a lot of telecom companies, thought the current paper process works, so chalta hai, right? But it took Jio to come in and say, you know what, I'm going to bet completely digital, and that allowed them to scale up to 100 million subscribers in a similar number of days. So that's fine. I mean, like I said, we take a 30 of view of these problems. So if it takes a year or two more, it's Okay. Is the uh, FIU have to register with some um, entities, right? RDI or uh, investment advisors. So a lot of these NBFCs, so a lot of these microfinance companies, small companies, they don't have NBFC license. They basically act as the channel partner for these large NBFCs, right? So going forward, how do they tap into? The no, so it, the data would be shared with the corresponding M M M M NBFC MFI that's regulated, and then you have a contractual agreement. So, so, I mean, yeah. um, there are these small lending companies, right? The red carpet of trading, let's say. So, they, they don't have NBFC licenses. Yeah, yeah. So, how do you, uh, how, how would it work? These NBFCs would first register with RBI. I mean, they are already registered. Yeah, so NBFC is not already. So, basically, FIU is any entity that's already registered or regulated yeah. by one of the four sectoral okay. regulators. Yeah. If you're not, then you may register or get regulated, yeah. right? And there are a few set of companies that, occup that operate as agents essentially data processors. And the way it works 
works in the abstract is you have a contractual agreement with the regulated entity, right? And the liability remains with the regulated entity, right? But you perform certain functions like underwriting, etc., on behalf of it, right? Okay. So the data gets shared with the regulated entity, but the 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 new age startup uh, that has this contract then processes the data, but liability remains with the regulated slash registered entity. The user would be giving permission to the NBFC A and not red carpet or to, to the NBFC MFI or whoever the actual lender is. Uh, related question to this, but in general, the FIPs are financial institutions, but FIUs need not be financial institutions per se. And for example, uh, your example of uh, giving your bank statement for getting a visa, and that is not a financial institution. And really, there could be tens of thousands of use cases like that. While I mean, general sizing, those are like hundreds. Tens, could be tens of thousands. So just constraining that to a financial institution type entity seems highly constraining. No, so that's just early days. I mean, uh, like I said, the Sri Krishna bill talks about giving users a right to data portability imported from any service provider to any other. To start off with, we're rolling off with finance and very practically most of the use cases that are very socio-economically relevant are prevalent in finance like credit, right? And over a period of time, it's just a matter of opening it up. So uh, in a phase-wise manner, that would happen. So uh, his question is, what's a revocation mechanism? How do I ensure data gets deleted? Revocation does not imply deletion of data first. Uh, revocation means, let's say I give consent to access my data every month for the next six months, uh, but I decide three months in, this FIU, like a PFM app, should not get access, so I can go to the AA and revoke access, and so the next time the FIU asks, it would be denied, right? Uh, deletion of data is a separate governance uh, requirement. It's a parameter in the consent artifact, but it really depends use case to use case. So in the case of a loan, if you've as a lender given out a loan to a borrower, you are mandated to store that loan file for say seven years, right? So even though you'll be, a user may revoke consent from you accessing his data for the purpose of monitoring, unless there's a law that says he can't, right? Uh, 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 the deletion of data is really subject to uh, a separate governance framework. So revocation and data deletion are not tied together. Okay, so once I give uh, consent to an FIU, can that data be sublet to somebody else? Is that uh, no, so th in that case, the FIUs are uh, sharing it with, say, data processors, and they have a contractual agreement for them, which, say, in the case of a bank, they may have an outsourced underwriting engine company that does that. That's fine. Cool. So basically, yeah, and, and what we see it is the same framework rolling out uh, in the case of healthcare uh, and the creation of health data access fiduciaries, while we're kind of further along. Uh, uh, on that journey, primarily because of the unstructured nature of the ecosystem, and similarly for telecom as well. Uh, so your call data records, your prepaid recharge history, etc. Uh, so that's about it, uh, folks. Uh, this is probably, as it rolls out, end June being the first pilot launch within banks with thousands of their employees. If any of you operate either on the uh, a pure FIU end or ancillaries to the FIU, it makes sense to start building out tooling uh, uh, right now to support FIUs, uh, or also on the FIP end, being a tech service provider, providing their FIP module um, and, and the like. So yeah. Uh, the revit spec, right? Uh, there's still a lot of changes are being made right? every day. Like, uh, we are part of a group, and we see like, uh, people asking different questions, and the SDO team is pointing, and they're like, hey, we didn't take this into consideration. So if the changes are being made, it's still right. And how, are, how is it currently going live? Yeah, so uh, his question is, uh, uh, the standard seems to be going through some amount of changes, so how is it going live? It's going to go through a number of changes, and that's the reason why we're going through a pilot phase. Most of those changes are actually minor. Only recently we did an XML to JSON change. Everything else is really very fine attribute levels. And for the pilot launch, a particular API version has been locked upon. Um, so that's the way it's taking place. So you're going to have some evolution in the specs as actual implementation happens. And that's already been factored in by market participants. And that's my point. You should be happy with the messiness and not crying about it. Uh, uh, and then once it reaches a particular stage, it's going to mature off, right? Because you can't really innovate on an API spec too much beyond a point. So probably six months from now, it will be very mature. So yeah. Uh, when you see this screen scraping thing, 
completely See, eventually it will be banned. Uh, the matter is really how fast this ecosystem rolls out. The EU regulators have already banned screen scraping and it's on a path of being phased out. Uh, uh, it's the same exists out here as well. I don't have a specific timeline, but uh, a number of the FIPs itself have written to the central bank asking for it to be banned. So it's quite likely at least those that quickly come on board the AA ecosystem would shut off screen scraping or make it illegal. Uh, 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 and whenever the central bank decides formally to issue a directive on that thing. Yeah, um, I just wanted to check if there's any sort around uh, data anonymity here. Um, is there, I mean, I, in, the, in the consent, uh, is there any way providers can uh, uh, talk about data? For example? So for example, uh, you know, if there are uh, uh, the uh, user, user side, you know, if there are, uh, let's say, analytics, analytics providers who yeah, yeah. Uh, are doing aggregate uh, analytics, uh, then the data providers might not be comfortable uh, no, so anonymous data set, as I've described in this slide, uh, uh, is basically a separate category of data set. So consent is applicable to personal data and generated data. Derived is left to be proprietary and a competitive strength to the players. And anonymous data sets do not require consent, right? And of course, uh, uh, that is hence outside the account aggregator framework, right? While of course, through the AA framework, you may expect research use cases, like I give consent to a set of researchers to access my data for, say, better health research. But we do expect the creation of anonymizers and then anonymous data sets being pulled out as a public good. For example, you have the UK Biobank where people donated genomic data and then that became a public good. We expect a similar set of data sets being put out as anonymized public goods so people can build out different models against it. Cool. Thanks a lot, folks, and thanks a lot to WeWork for hosting us. Hope it was useful.